Now, fresh from you know his debut yesterday, is uh, is my son Patrick. Um, hi again. Um, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, my name is Patrick. Um, yesterday I dedicated this summit to the 33 boys in my mum's behaviour school research. Um, my job today is to introduce you to my mum's research partners, Dr Penny Van Bergen and Dr Naomi Sweller, both from Macquarie University. They are going to present now from, the res from that research. Please note that the voice of Justin, who I am remembered in my speech yesterday. Please give it up for Penny and Naomi. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi everybody, and thanks very much Patrick for the really good welcome. Um, we'd like to talk about the findings from the project that we conducted, um, but we're taking a small part of those findings. What we wanted to do in particular is focus on some of the positive um, student-teacher relationships that we saw emerge, and in particular, uh, I guess some lessons for, for us as educators, ways in which we can better engage, um, better engage students that might be feeling disenfranchised. So to start with, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the ARC who funded our project, the New South Wales Department of Education and Communities, who after a little uh, bit of reluctance to begin with, were actually very kind of welcoming and allowed us to conduct our research uh, in their schools. But most of all to the schools that we worked with and the students in these schools who did give us a lot of time and a lot of their patience. So to begin with, I'm going to run down um, through a little bit of what the background research tells us about student-teacher relationships. Um, we know in the field that there are some characteristic telltale signs of very positive relationships and some characteristic or telltale signs of very negative relationships. It's worth noticing, noting that most of this research comes from the voices of teachers, often with teacher scales or teacher interviews. There's less that, um, that focuses on what students themselves think, so that's what we're going to do a bit later. But we know that very positive relationships tend to be high in closeness and they tend to be low in conflict and dependency. So the students that are getting on well with their teachers, or at least the teachers who believe that they're getting on well with the students, feel close to those students, they feel like their students aren't too demanding of them, but it's a fairly easygoing relationship. There's not a lot that they need to do there, they just enjoy each other's company. And that kind of relationship has benefits for both the student and the teacher. The characteristics of a neg negative relationship are one that's low in closeness, one that's typically high in conflict and or dependency, so one in which a student's getting in trouble a lot, they're getting in, um, a lot of reprimands, um, or they're constantly sort of dragging on the teacher. Teachers report that those mean that their relationship is not quite as good. Um, and it's detrimental to the needs of either the student or the teacher. So when we think about these relationships, they really have to be working for both parties. And we know that these relationships, when they're measured in those ways, based on closeness and conflict and dependency, they have massive impacts. So they impact students' academic achievement, not just at the time of a particular relationship, but going forward six years, 12 years. There's some research that suggests that they influence the kind of job and the type of salary students might be making on. There's in particular one study that looks at relationships that children had in kindergarten and found that these were still impacting them 30 years later. They impact engagement. They impact the way in which students are motivated, the way in which they come to class. Um, and I think it's probably important to note that we're not then saying that this is a factor of the student, um, but that that's something that we can do as teachers to better engage students. They impact socio-emotional, behavioural and cognitive adjustments, so how resilient a child is, how able they are to, to cope with setbacks. They impact their involvement in school activities, whether they want to participate or not, whether they're actually going to, to show up in the first place in some cases. And they impact feelings of connection to school. So actually feeling like this is a place that I belong and people care about me here. And I want to go back to that point that the characteristics of a negative relationship are typically high in conflict and dependency, because that's exactly what we see in this particular subgroup of, of students that we're interested in working with. So students that have disruptive behaviour, we tend to think of these students as being challenging in the classroom. 
They may be disrupting other students. In particular, they may come with distracting in class behaviours, constantly talking to somebody else, acting up, unregulated, angry or critical displays, aggressive responses to threat or to perceived threat. And what this does is it sets the ground for frequent conflict, conflict with other students and conflict with teachers and with students themselves. What this means is that these students are highly at risk to experience poorer quality relationships with teachers. It's important to note as well that disruptive behaviour is extraordinarily um, common. But what we're talking about often is the frequency with which behaviour occurs. It may be a very small difference, but when we're talking about a child who may have started, for example, in kindergarten or year one, very, very little children who don't yet have the opportunity to have developed all of these regulation skills, but they end up starting off on this wrong path right from the get-go. And what this does is it creates a legacy that is hard sometimes for students to break free from. So we might have an initial negative student-teacher relationship, and this feeds a so-called working model, so this kind of notion that students have of the way that I interact with teachers. And that guides their expectations when they come to their next student, uh, their next teacher. These teachers also have working models based on what other teachers talk about and those sorts of things. So as soon as that student moves to a next class, they're already primed to experience a relationship in a more positive way or in a more negative way. So even though positive student-teacher relationships are typically characterised by closeness, by this absence of, of conflict, by this absence of dependency, we can start to see even stronger impacts, even more importance for positive relationships for children who may be exhibiting disruptive behaviours. So we can say that the student-teacher relationship may be even more important by predicting outcomes for behaviourally behaviorally at-risk students, for students at risk of a negative student-teacher relationship in particular, so students that are already showing some of these, these kind of conflict signs, ha having this, this experience of a positive relationship can protect against numerous other negative influences, including maladaptive behaviour, negative life events, poor quality child-parent relationships, and referral to special education settings. It can also predict a range of behavioural and academic outcomes, not just within the school years, but perhaps also into adulthood. So even though conflict, even though disruptive behaviour is kind of a, a predictive factor for a negative student-teacher relationship, it doesn't have to be. Where students may be behaving disruptively but still experience a positive relationship with a teacher, that's the absolute key to getting these students back on a, a track that they're more comfortable with. That's the absolute key to making them feel as though they're more connected with school, that they've got better outcomes and that they, they have somebody that they can talk to. So in our study, we wanted to determine the past and current relationship perceptions of students with disruptive behaviour. So we know in the field that most research, particularly with younger children, is based on teachers' perceptions, but we wanted to know what students themselves say about good relationships that they have. To determine how these perceptions might differ according to school placement, so does it matter for a child who might have disruptive behaviour whether they've stayed in the mainstream or whether they've, um, they've left and gone to a special school for, for students um, who also have disruptive behaviour? And we also wanted to seek out exemplars of positive relationships so that we could see what makes these relationships positive. When these students are already at risk, when they're already exhibiting some signs of negative behaviour or behaviour that we would perceive as negative, what is it that makes this positive relationship for them? So we worked with three groups. Our first group was a cohort of students who were from a mainstream school and they hadn't shown any particular signs of disruptive behaviour. So they were in a sense our control group. We also worked with students in the same schools, same classes who had, these, uh, had signs of disruptive behaviour. And we worked with students who were in what we call SSP schools or schools for specific purposes. Um, where they were our behaviour school group. These were uh, students who had disruptive behaviour in the mainstream and had been sent to these schools instead or had unenrolled and enrolled in these new schools. So there was 96 participants across the three groups, an average age of 12 and a half, um, but a couple of years on either side we had um, student participants. And we conducted in-depth semi-structured interviews with these students. So we had some particular questions that we were interested in, but depending on what the students told us, we then followed those responses in and wanted to know a little bit more about them. When we're analysing the responses, we were looking for particular themes that might emerge in some groups and not others that we could compare. So we asked students initially who was the first teacher you remember having. It wasn't always the kindergarten student, but who a kindergarten teacher, but who was the teacher that was kind of furthest to go that you first remember? 
What did you remember about them? Do you think they liked you? So kind of what start did you get off to? Can you remember any teachers who you had a really good relationship with? And this is one that we're particularly interested in. And what made it a good relationship? Have you had any teachers who you really didn't get along with? So teachers that you just clashed with, you know, teachers you clashed with, what sort of things would bring that on? And moving now on to current relationships, what do you think your current teachers think of you? So we didn't say the word current, but that was kind of um, within the interview itself, that was, that was the, the um, they understood that that was the case. And for students who had moved schools, do you think, and that could have been because they'd moved into a behaviour school, it could simply have been students in the mainstream who had moved schools a number of times. Do you think the teachers at this school care about you? Um, and why do you think the teachers at this school are different? So initially we found that actually most students um, did think that their first teacher that they remember um, thought positively of them. So almost 90% reported that their te first teacher that they remember had liked them. And it didn't seem to matter what group students were in. So it didn't matter if they're in our behaviour school group, our mainstream behaviour group or our mainstream group. Um, so disruptive behaviour was having no influence there. Most students thought the first teacher they can remember, yeah, I think they liked me. But then something changes from that initial finding. When we ask students, do you remember any teachers who you've had a really good relationship with? So emphasis on this really good relationship. We found this really big difference. So pretty much all of the mainstream students said, yes, I can definitely remember a teacher like that. Most of our mainstream behaviour students, so remember that these are students who do have disruptive behaviour or whose teachers do think that they've got these disruptive behaviour characteristics, but they're still in the mainstream setting, most of them said, yes, there's teachers I've had really good relationships with. But when we come to the behaviour school, there's this big drop. So this is quite unusual, given that both the beha mainstream behaviour and the behaviour school group have disruptive behaviour. So something's going on here. When we asked, have you had any teachers you just really didn't get along with? We see a sort of a flip. <laughs> So most of the mainstream students, a majority, maybe about 60%, say, no, I've kind of got along with everybody. A significant minority, about 40%, say, yeah, there was at least one teacher I didn't get along with so well. But then we see both groups who had disruptive behaviour jump up. Yes, there's teachers I really didn't get along with. So these students are starting to differentiate between teachers who they work more effectively with and teachers who they don't work quite as effectively with. So we see there's very little difference there. There was a difference when we asked if you remember somebody who you got along really well with, but very little difference when we ask about someone you really didn't. So what we wanted to do is understand what's driving this difference. And in particular, given that both our mainstream behaviour student group and our behaviour school group both have disruptive behaviour, what's driving this difference in their perceptions? Why are they remembering their relationships that they've had with past teachers in different ways? And there's a couple of potential explanations. Um, so behaviour school students, we found they were less likely to remember positive relationships, these really strong beneficial relationships that will set them on a really good path. That's not to say that teachers necessarily haven't done good things with them. Lots of them had very good teachers, but they don't remember things that way. And compared to the mainstream behaviour students who are still in the mainstream school, it's possible that these students are simply have more severe disruptive behaviour and so they're not remembering any positive relationships. But I'm not so sure about that explanation because we know that the students in the mainstream behaviour group who still have disruptive behaviour do have quite challenging behaviour to deal with. So something, it's enough that they should be kind of, according to the, the standard research, should be all experiencing negative relationships. It's also possible that school placement clouds their memories of the past. So by the time you've sort of been kindly asked to potentially leave a mainstream school and perhaps you'd find it better over here in this other school, it's possible that there's kind of this negative stigma, this effect that, well, they didn't want me, nobody there cared about me, so really, no, I don't think there was any good relationships back there. So when we're remembering these events, it's not necessarily that they weren't positive at the time, but students aren't remembering that way. There's no legacy of positive relationships coming through. And why do these memories for past relationships matter? So, you know, if they're the ones in the past, if current ones are different, what's it matter? We know that these past experiences are still driving students' working models. So the way that teachers, the way that students perceive teachers having seen them, whether they think that those teachers cared about them, whether they thought that they had positive relationships, they're still driving how students will approach their next teachers and their next teachers, whether I'm somebody who teachers do care about or not. 
And we also know that the memories that these students have, um, when we talk in memory research, we talk about these different functions. You know, the, the memories you have serve different purposes. And we know that there are social functions, um, but in particular, we know that there are self functions. So the way that you remember things sort of build your self concept, build what you think about yourself. And if no teachers I remember having positive relationships with, then I probably wasn't a very good student, a very good person to belong in that school. They also have these directive functions, so similar to the working models, they guide the way that you go about the, the next experiences you have with teachers in your future. We then asked, do you think teachers at this school care about you? So right now, do these teachers care about you? And here we see something interesting as well. Most mainstream students, those without disruptive behaviour, say, yes, I think these teachers care. But then we get this big drop. The students that are in the mainstream behaviours group so the students that are still in the mainstream, who did remember having some teachers in their past who were positive, say, no, I don't think they care. And the students who are in the behaviour school, this separate educational setting, say, yes, I do think these teachers care. About 80% of them said, yes, I think the teachers here care. Even though I can't remember teachers in my past who I got along well with, I think these teachers care about me. So we're seeing, almost seeing a flip with these two groups. So we wanted to know, okay, well, what's going on? Why do these students, think that the teachers care about them? Why do you think the teachers at this school are different? And we start to see this common theme running through. Ethan, who's 14, says, and it's probably important to note that these are pseudonyms, I think it's mostly because they're trying to be different. They're a lot more reasonable, a lot more lenient. They'll stop and take time to listen to you and stuff. And yeah, they'll talk about shit. George, age 15, says straight away, they listen to you. They give you more respect. They don't pressure you to do what they want you to do. Like, they give you, like, chances. Like, if you want to do this, then go outside for five minutes. With my other school, it was just like, now do this now or I'll call the principal. They'll try to threaten me or something. Justin, who's 13, says they understand and they listen and they always help out. Like, if I had these teachers in my previous school, it would have been the perfect school. I think that's really telling, right? And Reuben, who's 12, says, oh, because they're like easygoing and they care and they get along and with more understanding. They talk. When you talk, they listen and they'll listen to what you say. So we start to see this really common thread from these students who are saying, yes, I do think I've got disruptive behaviour, so they should be predicting a negative relationship, but I think the teachers at this school do care about me because they're listening to me. They're listening to what I have to say. That's not to say that teachers in the mainstream setting are not listening but students are perceiving those relationships differently. So mainstream behaviour students are perceiving themselves to have more negative current relationships with their teachers. It's possible that they're comparing themselves to the mainstream students in the same class, that is, that they know that they're the naughty kids. It's also possible, however, that the teachers in the, in the separate setting, in the SSPs, the special schools, have greater opportunities to connect with these students. They have possible time dedicated more to these students. I think we heard the comment before about class sizes. These were often very small class sizes, so much greater opportunities to listen and to connect. They have the expertise to know how to foster these relationships. And by virtue of being in this environment, they've probably seen it a little bit more often, and that is they might be a little bit less combative. There are some very good teachers in the mainstream who are doing exactly these same things, but the students aren't always perceiving it. They're getting a bit more of a mixed picture. So why do these current perceptions matter? We know that they're driving students' current academic engagement and achievement. We know that they're driving their social-emotional adjustment, that is their resilience, their ability to cope with setbacks, and their feelings of belonging in the school setting. And there's less ongoing um, symptoms of disruption. That is, when students perceive themselves as having teachers who care, who are listening, and who they get along well with, that challenging behaviour actually lessens. So I think there's some lessons in here that we can start to think about. Uh, we know that student-teacher relationships are critically important, yet they receive far less attention than academic performance indicators do, particularly in the press, particularly in curriculum design. So while all students benefit from positive teacher-student relationships, they're especially important for these students at risk. Mm -hmm. So we need to know how can we best foster them, and we did start to see some potential avenues to do that. 
but there's some challenges here. We know that teachers are increasingly under pressure. There's a lot less time to cultivate these relationships that are meaningful to students. And where there is these efforts to cultivate relationships, sometimes to teachers, particularly in the mainstream, are working against these negative perceptions. Because students already have these negative work, um, working models, they're already expecting a negative relationship, it means that teachers are going to have to go even further above and beyond to let students know that I'm here and I'm listening and we can make this about you. So less time can lead to this perception of what we might call transactional or empty relationships. And these relationships fail to provide the connections that students are looking for and which schools really need to have when things are going wrong. You know, these can actually really prevent things from escalating further. So what we know is that students and teachers need the time to focus on the student-teacher relationship. A lot of it does come down to time. They need the time to be able to let students know that, yes, I'm here, yes, I'm listening. Um, and that students need that time to sort of start to see that, yes, that is the case. So we need to build time into the, into the school curriculum and into the, what schools do for this kind of relationship building and not just testing. So we ask a little bit tongue in cheek, should we place relationship indicators on my school too? Would we start to see these kind of cramming sessions for relationships instead? And that is tongue in cheek, but I think it's important that we focus on the things that we know help students and that make things work for students. So in the words of Albert Einstein, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. But we know that these relationships are nonetheless very important, particularly for students who already have challenging behaviour. Okay, thanks very much. Does anyone have any questions for... Penny and Naomi and myself. So, um, if not, I'll make a comment. We've, we've, ah, there, good. Is that Camilla? I feel like romper room. Um, I'm wondering with all the debate about initial teacher education, whether there's something that can be done in initial teacher education to help prepare teachers to develop these types of relationships, particularly with at-risk at students? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, think, I think there are sort of some kernels of change, and I think that, um, that this kind of... Uh, the importance of the teacher-student relationship is starting to emerge, mm -hmm. but I think there are two factors working against it. One is history, um, which is that teacher education programs have traditionally focused much more on pedagogy and curriculum. And I mean, I know, for example, um, at my own teacher education program at Macquarie, we learn about teacher-student relationships, but it's in third year as an elective. Um, so a lot of students don't <laughs> learn about it, um, and then they go on to have their own classes. So I think straight away, we're not necessarily equipping teachers with some of the knowledge that's really important, and we leave them to sort of, to make it work. Um, and that works better for some students than others. Um, I think the other thing that is, is challenging um, in trying to kind of f force a greater focus on, on some of the, the socio-emotional aspects of education, which includes this relationship, are uh, the, the demands about what a teacher education program must include for accreditation. And they're so cram-packed that sometimes we've got trouble doing anything until we get to those later electives. And so I think um, we need to be doing more, but there's probably also room for... Um, for the, the accreditation process to take that into account, which will allow universities a little more freedom to do what they need to do, which will allow teachers greater expertise, greater freedom to do what they need to do. So I think there's that trickle down effect as well. Yeah. So maybe we can all start to lobby Aitzel. I wonder in, in your research and, and the work that you've been doing that you, that you make distinctions between the kinds of relationships that, that students and teachers have for example, distinguishing between, you know, what might be a personal relationship and what might be a pedagogical relationship? We do, um, we do ask students about sort of, um, you know, going further, kind of, you know, what makes this good, what makes this bad, and we've sort of looked at um, whether it's academic support um, or this kind of relationship. It seems that that theme about listening kind of emerges irrespective. It's almost like a, a prerequisite and then you can get to the other things. Um, we ask students as well, you know, what do you like about this school? Um, and, you know, do you like this school better than your other school? What do you like about it? And we found that often students were saying, yes, I really like this behaviour school, but when they were saying why, 
Um, it was because of the support from the teachers and it was because of being able to pursue activities that they enjoyed, but they actually wanted to go back to the mainstream school for a greater kind of academic content. So I think they are getting different things from different environments. Um, we haven't delved as much into the student-teacher relationship data quite as much to look for underlying themes that might distinguish between, um, between the kind of the purely academic and the, I guess, the more social relationship. But it may be um, that the, the, I guess, the more social kind of relationship, we do start to see those elements of, for example, care and um, listening and consideration coming through, in particular in the behaviour schools. Um, so I think we need to go further into the data, but I think there probably are different kinds of relationships emerging as well, yeah. Um, hi, I just wanted to say that I work at one of these behavioural schools and that uh, relationship and rapport with the kids is absolutely key to any success that we have. But I would also have to say there are times in creating that rapport that we really do feel like there are trapeze artists without a safety net. My concern is that, and I have no way of intellectualising this, is that if you start trying to formalise what should be a good rapport or a what defines a good relationship, that, my God, there will be so many warning flags that fly up, that do fly up now, with how much you should and shouldn't share and at what point that you need to hand that relationship over to somebody more experienced. It becomes a minefield. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I mean, I think that's absolutely the case, and I think it is uh, a tricky line to, to tread, particularly when you're talking about relationships that students may see differently to the teacher. I mean, the, as teachers, you have a kind of a professional relationship that goes with a professional sense of care for your mm. charges, but for some students, you're, you may be an essential lifeline. You know, you may be kind of everything. You may be the sole reason that they're coming to school and that they become better engaged there may be more disruptive relationships elsewhere in their life and so you become this kind of central pillar. And I mean, I, mean, I guess going back to what some of the research shows for these students, the positive relationship is critical, but it, it needs to, um, I, I mean, I, I think um, it, it needs to remain a professional one, of course. Um, and I, I guess the the best way of, of sort of doing that, and I think at the moment we probably don't know enough about how to manage that, you know, I mean, I think in the behaviour schools we saw from the data that you guys are doing an amazing job, but like you say, you're a sort of trapeze artist, you're kind of doing it as you come and sort of managing it and juggling it as you go. Um, I think we need a better understanding of, um, of kind of, if, if this was something that made its way into, sort of to go back to the previous um, question, to made its into teacher education programs, we'd almost need kind of a set of, you know, the basic ground rules, this is what works, this is what, what you can't do. Um, and from there, I mean, relationships are inherently, um, I guess, you know, intuitive. From there, there's always going to be differences in the way that that looks. But I think um, rather than focusing on how much we give, simply giving students a minimum of um, not just I'm listening to you, but really explicitly I want you to know that I'm listening to you, um, I think that's a really good place to start. As you get up to the upper level with very um, tough cases, then I think we need more research. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just want to make a comment on that one. Um, actually, what these, these boys were asking for was, was very simple. Um, and they weren't... Uh, and, and the other thing is that um, if, if you try to be their friend, um, that'll fail because then they will see you as a try-hard. Um, and if you're not genuine, they will spot it like that and they don't like it. What they were asking for in the main was, you know, that point about listen. Um, and what they were talking about elsewhere in the interview um, quite often was feeling like a number. And, and they actually did comment about, you know, and, and I think they were sometimes uh, quite understanding um, and pointing out that, well... It's easier in the behaviour school, I guess, because there's only 30 kids here, whereas there's 700 in my last school. You know, the teachers can't get around everybody. Yeah, so they were saying things like that. But what made them angry was that they needed help and they wanted help. And they would put their hands up in the class and they would get ignored. And they would talk about, you know, the teachers care about the smart kids. They don't care about us. They would say to us, don't you rub any of you off on them about the smart kids. 
So a lot of what they were saying was they just want to be noticed. Um, they want, and they don't want to be embarrassed either. So they don't want to put their hands up, have to put their hands up to say, I need help, I didn't understand that. You know, as one boy said, I'd be doing that all day. So what they want is for their teachers to, to notice them, to see them, to take a little bit of extra time, to listen to them. And when they've got shit going on at home, um, as many of them did, that there would be some understanding about that. So, you know, if they weren't wearing their proper black shoes, well, there's a reason for that. And to take the time to listen for what that reason was. So it's, it's not rocket science, hey? <laughs> okay, thanks very much.